any other questions? Um, so. I have a question uh, following up. Okay. So a follow up on the point Neil was making about the fine fuels, I'm just wondering about releasing shrubby fuels. So if you have, um, you know, perhaps crown fire potential has been lowered, but what about, in, say, a scrub oak stand where you have all of the nutrients and all of the light that's come in, and you have then a shrub system? Um, then what, how has that changed the fire dynamic um, and fire risk? And um, the second question I had is about the thinning. You had mentioned that because you've killed enough pine through pine beetle that it's come below um, the threshold for, um, <coughs> for the basal area. But what if the oaks in there keeping it above that, then how easy is the infestation to move around if it has a dense mid-story oak overstory, um, even if the pines are? you know, over 20 foot spacing, can the beetle still move through because the pheromone plumes are um, contained underneath the hardwood overstory? Um, the, the, first, the first question, certainly. Um, you're absolutely right. And it may take a little while for that to, to occur. Um, one thing we saw with the slight increase in cover was actually not much of a increase in height, but, a, but, a, but an increase in the leaf area of those shrubs. So they're getting denser. Um, some of those, some of those uh, treatments involve so much disturbance to the understory that it's probably just now that really the, you know, the shrubs are, are starting to, to catch up with that. But those stands are open, and I would expect that to actually get quite a bit denser. And there were um, definitely scrub oaks in some of those upland stands. Um, so that is going to be a, a, a fire management issue in the future, I think. So I believe you're right. Um, because I guess I focused on crown fuels primarily because for us, that our catastrophic fires are really crown fires. And, and so, um, uh, New Jersey Forest Fire Service, and I think Tom can back me up on this, can, can deal with, with shrub fires pretty well. It's really those crown fires and, 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 and large crown runs that are, that are really worried. And, and for your uh, second question, there is there are trade-offs there uh, when you have those mixed type stands where you have some hardwood and some pine. Um, I tend to think that when you get enough of the forest is, is oak or other things, even though the basal area is fairly high, uh, your hazard conditions are lower because well, there's not that many pine, there's not that much pine out there, and then there's also some evidence that show that uh, green leaf volatiles coming from the other trees kind of mask the, um, and kind of disrupt where the beetles are are flying around or where the source of the pheromone is. Um, so basal area is important, where the pheromone plume is important, but also uh, you, those mixed stands can be lower hazard conditions, depending on how much pine is in there in the mixture. Um, so Ken, you were talking about mixed stands, but I was wondering in New Jersey, at least where you were doing your studies, if you had any stands that had black locusts in them, or also, I guess, as part of that question, if there were other invasives that might have moved into those gaps. And as well, also as far as that question, um, do you see the potential for invasives taking over some of these areas that may or may not have been treated? Those, that, those are good questions. We, there's very little black locust in the, in the pine forests. And it's, it's, it's probably, most of those soils are, are greater than 90% sand. So it is, you know, it's, it's very sandy soils. And believe it or not, as long as there's no change to the soil and to the soil pH, so it's quite acidic soils too, much like here. There's actually very few invasives in, in the core of the pine barrens. 
certainly other areas, you know, with higher pH soils, invasives are just a huge problem in New Jersey. But it, it's it's curious. It's sort of amazing how few invasives actually come into these sites, even though they're as open as they are, with you know, with the canopy openings and things like that. So, yeah, it's, I, we're very lucky. We're very fortunate. I think that you know that has not been a big problem for us. I just added to that that um, short-term studies by Jordan Raphael at National Parks Service and Fireland is showing that myelin is pro is recruiting in those uh, open gaps. So that is a concern that we do have. Mm, yeah. We have time for one other question before we have the rest of the speakers from last night today join the panel discussion. So. I just had a uh, quick question for, for John from, from your talk. You were talking, or either of you, about the cut and leave. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't quite understand the, that that's even a, a good option. It, it, unless the, are the eggs still hatch on trees that are felled? Um, you know, the lar larvae of the, of the beetle or it just seems to me like why spend the effort to cut them if you're not really doing anything? That's a good question. It does, um, cut and leave works better where you're cutting the trees down and the, the sun gets on them and kind of bakes those beetles. Mm -hmm. But cut and leave still works in that um, they don't emerge in the same kind of pattern and you're, you've disrupted that pheromone communication system through the cut and, cut and leave. So. Um, you do sometimes have breakouts, but it's a good thing with either cut and leave or cut and remove to monitor that and come back maybe two weeks later and see if you've had, you know, some adjacent trees uh, impacted. But um, cut and leave is still fairly effective in disrupting the pheromones. Um, so I think we're going to transition now into um, having a full panel discussion with yesterday's. Oh, just today's, <laughs> just today's. So, uh, Inga, yeah, if all of our speakers uh, could come up to the front from today, and we're going to join forces and also have Kathy and the two Johns come on up. <laughs> and they'll have to introduce themselves and give a little background. So, it should be a up here. So, because we are we are recording this um, for uh, if you get asked the question, could you please paraphrase the question back because we won't have an extra microphone to hang around. Okay. So we heard a little bit about our speakers, but um, if you guys could. Just introduce yourselves, the additional people, and, and uh, give us a little background before we start. Uh, sure. John Pavisic, Executive Director of the Central Pine Barrens Commission. Uh, I've been working in the public sector for over 30 years, uh, first at the municipal level at Brookhaven Town when I was in the Environmental Protection Division. I uh, got to do all kinds of uh, fun, odd jobs, and certainly playing in the woods. Uh, then uh, for ten and a half years as a regional permit administrator at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, two and a half years as Suffolk County Parks Commissioner. Uh, Suffolk County Parks uh, happens to have um, uh, over 50,000 acres of, of parkland. It's, uh, I believe, one of the largest municipal uh, parkland uh, owners and managers in the United States. And then for almost the last seven years, I've been the executive director here at the uh, Central Pine Barrens Commission. My problem is I can't seem to hold down a job for too long. <laughs> <laughs> is there anybody else? Yeah. So my name is uh, John Burnett. <laughs> I was a uh, contractor for the Forest Service for seven years. I've worked all over the country, and it's kind of ironic that I spent a lot of time down south, and now we have this issue of Southern Pine Beetle in New York, I swear I didn't bring it. But um, I've been serving as the acting regional forester for Region 1 DEC, uh, Long Island. So I'm responsible for 17,000 acres. I would say 99% of it's in the Pine Barren Corps itself. 
Hi, I'm Kathy Schwager. I'm the ecologist here at BNL. Um, before I've been here for seven years, six years, six years. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was at the Nature Conservancy for seven years, which is how I actually got into fire. Um, uh, some of the work that I do here is I, I write burn plans and I do fuels monitoring and some forest health monitoring and now pine beetle monitoring and do a lot of monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I love fire, and this is, I mean, forest health is kind of near and dear to my heart, so this is really important to me, and that's why I'm here. So, we have our local folks, and we have our folks from out of town that have given us some perspective on, you know, their experiences, and so the goal of this part is to, you know, give Give everybody a chance to ask each other questions on the panel. Give you all a chance to ask more questions of the panel. But looking ahead as to where do we go from here uh, for Long Island in particular. And so given all that we've learned <laughs> in, the, in the past two days, um, you know, what, what are the next steps? Where can we go from here? And so I'll ask you to kind of keep that in mind as in your discussion. So, um, Go ahead, if, if anyone has any questions to start, um, go for it. <laughs> How about our look? Oh, back here. Hi, Walter Bureau from New York State Parks. Um, given that uh, pines aren't merchantable on Long Island, um, what about the feasibility of doing cut and leave for southern pine, uh, southern pine beetle treatment and then uh, doing a prescribed burn, is that something that's even feasible? Given the fuel concerns there? Well, that is, <laughs> we would like it to be feasible. That's one of the parts, uh, the demonstration forest, uh, we received a grant from the Forest Service, so we're able to do that. We're going to this afternoon, and we're looking at doing that in those areas. So looking at exactly cut and leave and what that affects the fire and, and risk from that, and how easy it would be to light the fire or to fold. Has anyone there experienced, have any experience with that? Or is there any research papers or experience out there? We've tried doing prescribed fires in the Albany pine bush with a lot of heavies on the ground, a lot of logs, really aspen that were cut or, or treated a couple of years earlier. And for us, the biggest hurdle for us is smoke management. We have to have all smokes out by dark. So there is there is no smoldering. So I, any any time we have large loads, fuel loads like that, um, <coughs> logs, heavies on you know, thousand hour fuels and larger on the ground, it's an issue for us in that we can't necessarily guarantee that we're going to be able to mop that up by dark. And the worst smoke is the evening smoke, and at night when you get inversion and that low smoldering burning, not even any open flame generates enough smoke, settles low and follows valleys. Typically that's where roads and people are. So it's, it, it, can be a, it can be a hassle. So I'm anxious to see what these guys learn from trying to do a prescribed fire with that kind of fuel on the ground. Do you, I don't know, do you all have the same smoke issues here? Yes. With smolder? So I would be very concerned about that potential. That nuisance smoke at night, it's not even very much smoke, but it can be extremely problematic for your, for your neighbors. So you don't actually burn when you have that kind of fuel? We're contracting right now with our with the new WR Wildland Risk Reduction Grant to go into areas where we had treated aspen and remove it. It's on the ground now. The trees have fallen and we aren't we it's just too much. So in that testing, um, would it be more useful then or would you recommend just trying to chip as much as and then provide the opportunity. So if you can you mentioned that in the chip suppression, that provide a little bit more disturbance for the yeah. recruitment. Um, if then they cut and leave, but then <clears throat> that also provides the opportunity for burning because you're reducing it, the size Depending, be careful. Yes, but when you come, when you when you chip and if you leave the chips on site, yeah. now you've in, you've influenced the surface area volume ratio of your fuel. And realize, for no matter what you're burning, it only really burns from the outside in. So by getting rid of all that, basically you've increased the volume of fuel you have and decreased the surface area, it will smolder forever. Well, not forever. It'll smolder for a long time. I would also be very cautious about chipping and leaving that on site. If you chip, 
And there's a chip market on the island where you can take that offsite and chip it and stockpile it for sale or distribution. That would be ideal. But again, leaving the chips on the ground would actually in some ways be worse from the perspective of prescribed fire than leaving the logs on the ground because you can't even, you, it'll be hard to even get that stuff to burn. Um, a couple of things. Yes, we did chipping initially at Montague, and that just effectively eliminates fire for, I don't know how long, 10 years or something like that. We then went to piling and created 200 huge piles, and that was a hassle. Um, I, I'm trying to think back on the large fires that we did um, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s at Camp Edwards, where we were burning four or 500 acres, up to 800 acres, and we were under the same constraint no smoke after four o'clock. Um, and in order to hopefully achieve that, uh, we had prescriptions that were like one hour fuels, seven or eight percent, 10 hour fuels, under 10, 20 hour fuels, over uh, 20 to 25, um, and thousand hour fuels, there weren't that many of them. Um, we would get one <coughs> day a year, uh, and we had to have all the burns done by Mar the end of March. Um, but it was on the Cape, so we, we had a couple of months. Um, I remember flying back from Texas just to get a burn because we had a, a, a good burn day that day, supposedly. Uh, the long and short of it is it's impossible to not have smoke after 4 o'clock under those large acreage conditions. <coughs> Even when you, you know, we were getting equipment stuck in the mud from two inch rainstorms two or three days before and we were still having problems with snow. Um, so uh, again, it's a matter of scale. On the other hand, that one acre burn that we did in the um, Miles Standish there where it was uh, a looper killed after the fifth set of fire, I don't honestly remember any smoke issue um, or smoldering issue, I should say. Uh, I don't remember staying out in an order late, late to make sure there were all smoke throughout. And we didn't use the 6,000 gallons to, to drench the site. Um, what we found was that 34 tons per acre decomposed pretty rapidly. And I think about it because, uh, you know, we had a 200-year-old house that hard, had hard, hard pine, pitch pine flooring, and pitch pine was thought of as hard pine. But when you grow it fast after a fire, it decomposes pretty quickly. You get a growth range like this, um, and it'll grow two or three feet a year. I don't know, maybe somebody else has had experience with this, but you know, it goes pretty quickly. To add something in on the chipping, we've been able to we've been able to do some burning in, in chipping. There's a it's, you have to use the right technique with a good operator for masticated fuels where they're more shredded instead of chipped. Um, and it, you, so. I can talk more about it if somebody's interested on exactly you know the tools that have to be used, but it, there's a way to do it, and then you have to burn it earlier in the season while it's still wet, so you might not get it all the way down to bare soil, but might um, but you can burn a good bit of the fuels after it's been masticated. And Alex, is that masticating shrubs and understory, or masticating bowls of trees? Both. Okay. Um, oaks are pretty hard because it's. I don't know if you've ever burned oak compared to pine, <coughs> where it's a lot hotter, so you can put less on the ground. But we've used techniques where there's a lot of trees. Maybe we just top them and leave them as kind of standing snags to be dealt with later um, to keep the fuel loads down. But you have to use a hammerhead on mastication <coughs> instead of uh, if you have sharp teeth that'll chip it into small little chips that will either just smolder or not burn. Um, if you can have it ripping big pieces, then um, you've created more of like um, you know, mm -hmm. one in 10 hour fuels. And we had to, we had to teach our contractors with the so kind of heads. There's techniques, but it's, it's tricky. And if, you, if somebody does it wrong, then you've created um, a place yeah, when, when I speak of chipping, years. it's this is a very specific kind of chipping. Yeah. And that's not masticating, um, it's not flail lower. So you have a range of literally taking nothing off the site and producing that much chip like this, and you, you can't burn that, but if you masticate, then the trick is to not get them to do too much. You get people who want to make two or three passes through there, one's enough, just get the fuel bed down, and then you can burn it okay. So, yeah, it's an art. 
associated with what you call chipping. I just want to encourage people to explain some of the terms as they go. I think mean, some people don't understand the you know, one hour, <coughs> ten hour fuel thing and the mastication. And some of those terms might not be I'm back to uh, selling uh, fire in the fire in the Pine Barrens uh, as something more supportable uh, from a public and political standpoint. To what extent can we use fire as an enemy of the pine beetle and encourage more um, more burning? I mean, responsibly. Well, um, you can't. Like if there's active infestations, you can't just burn the beetle up. But as a preventative practice, prescribed fire as part of your overall management is certainly a valuable tool. And I, I would really try to sell it as restoring the pine barrens or maintaining that ecosystem. If that's important to the citizens here on Long Island, that's what I would be. That's what I'd mm -hmm. be selling, and that's fire is going to be part of that management as well as the mechanical thinning. That, that's where I would go with it. And you can include southern pine beetle in there too, you know. It's almost like the beetle is a symptom and the forest health is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, last night uh, someone mentioned a, a tick reduction program from the past where fire was used to uh, control ticks and we know the natives uh, were in for that reason too. Uh, but the uh, we just don't have enough science right now. Uh, there was a study done down south that, that did show uh, a quantifiable reduction in ticks with frequent burning in these woodland uh, sites. We haven't replicated that up here. We need the Board of Health to get behind that because the flip side of that is uh, through these burning, we are also creating better habitat for the small mammals that are supporting the ticks. So it's, 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 we don't really know the answer to that yet, but I would much rather sell tick reduction to the public and beetle reduction, which is less likely. So, so much of the question on Long Island is what do you do with the wood, uh, whether it's thinning for forest health or thinning for southern pine beetle. Uh, so I was just curious if you know, the panel has any thoughts or any insight as to potential markets, maybe some lessons from Albany. Um, what do you do with the wood or where could we take it? I think it's advantageous to be on the mainland. For us, we're, we're harvesting pitch pine and there is, a, there is a company who's using it for flooring actually. So that's a different subcontractor who's doing the pitch pine thinning than the rest of it. Almost everything else is being chipped. Either going to the finch pine paper mills in Glens Falls where they actually power their plant with chips. I'll take locust, hardwood, any of that, any of that high BTU content wood, but also then in Vermont, there are um, cogeneration plants that are producing heat and power, and I think similar to Massachusetts maybe, but there, there's the, that biomass production is, is where we're, we're sending our wood. I'm actually going to pass it to Tim because he can explain, but we must have gone through four or five different kinds of markets at Montague. Uh, yeah, we did uh, the initial uh, cutting, uh, actually went to Canada, both logs and ships, uh, partly because the Canadians uh, subsidized their, their mills and their workers. Uh, it was so heavy, and we tried to warn them that these chips were very heavy, that the first load that went off the plane uh, was stopped by the state police, because even though the trailer wasn't full, springs were and backwards uh, and then following that uh, this uh, chip market in uh, New Hampshire Dartmouth and in Maine within striking distance uh, allowed us to uh, essentially break even they could take that material and, uh, and, and use it but you had to have enough acres for the volume to get up there too so it's a, it's a developing we, we need to really uh, think creatively about what to do with these products rather than waste them. On Long Island, with all of the stereotypical development 
and mulching that everybody does in, in your typical suburban neighborhood. Where, where does the mulch come from now that's being used on Long Island? Is it all being imported? I was just curious, uh, in speaking about that, because uh, there's uh, historical evidence, I guess, from at least 100 years ago or maybe 200 years ago about uh, the use of pine tar. And uh, uh, from here, they used to call, uh, the folks who used to gather that were called tar men. I think there were some, uh, some stories from uh, Brookhaven Hamlet on the south shore of the island where we had you know, part of our pine barrens or, or extant. So I'm just wondering if um, there have been besides you know, using um, pitch pine for flooring or for chips or for biomass, has there been any work done in terms of uh, extracting pine tar or uh, turpentine or um, or anything? Any demonstration projects that that folks have uh, have developed? Well, first, uh, I think Tim, the, the logs they're piling up at Money You now are going back to Canada or cabinets or something, and then coming back to the United States. But to get to your question, actually, an expert on this that we heard two weeks ago, Emery Gluck, uh, he had a fantastic presentation at the New England Natural History Conference on the pine tar industry in Connecticut. Uh, naval stores, um, they didn't know they had that much pitch pine in all of Connecticut to lead the nation, including the South, in production of naval stores. So there was. And we postulate before that that Native Americans were using um, pine tar that they got by actually axing cuts, which then turned into what looked like fire stars when fires went through there, to uh, caulk their birch bark canoes. Um, and uh, so, what have, relevance does that have today? I don't know. <laughs> but it's certainly been done in the past on a large scale. You know, if I may, I'd like just to discourage the notion that the um, only way we can deal with the pine beetle is to find a market for something in the pine barrens. We could spend what we spend protecting the pine barrens in the first place and its value to tourism and everything else to justify a three and a half million dollar a year management plan, which has been approved now twice by the legislature, which is in the Environmental Protection Fund now, and which has yet to find its way through the DE. We should be investing in this, not having to sell something else in order to get it done. I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's uh, been, been one of my uh, mantras for, for many years now that uh, you protected that land, you protected the deed, not anything beyond that. You, you bought an obligation. Last comment on this. The people of Suffolk County alone are paying two and a half times the national average in taxes, and yet voluntarily at referendum they put up a billion dollars to protect the Pine Barrens. We can spend three or four million dollars a year maintaining them. Just in response to that, I'll just point out that we are, we're, we're moving in the direction of that, that type of management um, collectively uh, and cooperatively. Uh, the commission is working very closely, for example, with, um, with DEC, New York State DEC, and Suffolk County Parks, uh, just in terms of Southern Pine Beetle response and management. And, uh, you know, we have devoted um, the commission resources uh, made expenditures in terms of equipment, including uh, the smartphone technology, training of folks, um, hiring of, of, of interns, and also full-time staff to devote to uh, Southern Pine Beetle Management. Uh, the Commission has also committed um, uh, over a half million dollars over a five-year period towards ecological management and, uh, and fuel reduction and wildfire prevention uh, in the Pine Barrens. And again, we're working cooperatively with the New York State DEC uh, and County Parks on their properties uh, to address those issues. We're working on some uh, actual implementation of, of plans that will also will serve not only to perform ecological management and wildfire reduction, but also have the added benefit of accomplishing 
the, uh, the thinning that has been uh, discussed, uh, getting down to the basal areas and those, those particular properties, the basal areas that have been talked about today that you need to, uh, to achieve in order to uh, uh, make um, uh, remaining pitch pines uh, viably uh, withstand a, uh, an infestation. So um, you're, we're, we're moving in that direction. We're, hope, we're, we're hoping to start implementation over the next year or so. I think that's an example of that that we can certainly use as a model for the additional funding that that uh, New York State puts forward. I would just say that uh, Amy McIntyre State Parks, I find this uh, discussion valuable because not be moving forward, but kind of dealing with what what we have now have on the ground. Um, and one park in particular was hit very very hard. Um, and we just have huge piles of huge trees all over the park. And it's frightening to think about what would happen if it caught on fire. And one other thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if this is just an anomaly, but we, um, you know, we were chipping them and lining our trails with the chips. And we have found the chips to be wonderful, wonderful avenues for breeding ticks. So we can't even use it for that anymore. So, and you know, not, I'm not looking at it as a way to uh, make money on the pine barrens, you know, the pine trees. I'm looking at it as maybe we can break even if we can, because state parks can't afford to remove all this wood, right? So. Afford is a relative term. I would encourage you to think about long term costs versus short term costs. Obviously, you've got budgets you're going to work with. But it's encouraging to hear that, that the local, it's encouraging to hear that folks living and, and loving the Pine Barrens are supporting. When I hear you say, protecting the Pine Barrens, I'm assuming you mean do this kind of work, like do the thinning and the burning and get this place healthy again. We didn't buy it for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's an incredible place to start. And it's great that you're here. And I think the fact that you had a symposium on Southern Pine Beetle a few weeks ago, another one today, uh, from the outside looking in, and that's the only prism I have, unfortunately, is I. I see a growing momentum on the island and within the Pine Barrens to start doing more of that kind of work. But you've got to start somewhere. And having these meetings, pulling, pulling everybody together and get the conversation going is sometimes the hardest part. So I'm really grateful for BNL and for the National Fire Sign, um, and for NAFSI, for facilitating these meetings, because I think that's, that's the place to start. And hopefully with the will and the funding and the political will, you'll be able to continue and take this momentum to start making more happen on the ground. I have a question. Sorry. Um, the, I, what I'm wondering, is there anything that fire on top of the thinning does that is more helpful than just thinning alone? So, and can we carry that fire? Whether it's leaving it on site or chip, you know, chip masticating, or you know, so what? What would be the best combination um, for restoration and for regeneration of this pine in particular? So, is is prescribed fire an important part of that uh, interaction? I would say yes, um, if for no other reason than pitch pine needs mineral soil to to regenerate, uh, to germinate. So I feel like fire has to be a part of the equation if we really, really are serious about getting pitch pine as a, a part of the ecosystem again, so, as, the, as it should be. So, so I'm wondering if like, your, your cleared ones, um, you said there was more mineral soil exposed there. Does that kind of stimulate? It, it, it's, it seems like it does. I mean, that's definitely where you see the most of the regeneration of, from sea levels. The highest densities were in the most disturbed areas. And for a while, at least, you have an open canopy, too. So there's definitely a window, it seems, where you know, that's, that's possible to do. Um, and again, like, like I mentioned to Neil, is that, uh, that litter does decompose faster. So there's, there's less 
sort of forest floor material at least for a little while, and that was sort of interspersed between the coarse wood. So, you know, there's definitely some niches in there that, that can be, that, that would facilitate pine regeneration, it seems. And I guess if you added fire on top of that, you know, I, I know we have, with New Jersey Forest Fire Service, I don't think we burn any of these treatments yet, a very few of them. But that's something to look at, too. So I, I couldn't answer that question about so what happens you know, after these treatments. You know, not so much in our silvicultural treatments, but we never, with all of our garments using fire, we never saw adequate pitch pine recruitment at all. Only on the trails, and it's only after we've done these growing season burns by eliminating litter and duff that we're actually seeing a new core hole, new, a new group of seedlings coming in. Um, oh, yeah, I would expect that mechanical, mechanical work, if it scarifies the soil, will expose some mineral soil. Then the question becomes, is that enough to get you a new stand of pitch pine that you want at the density you want, and I think ultimately, you know, I don't, I don't look at two, I don't look at two management units in the pine bush the same way because it dep the well, how you're managing that stand depends on the history of that site and what you want to do with it and what the species composition is. So to some degree, it depends, but I would think mechanical and fire would could help. That's right. And there's one other uh, factor. Um, you do need the mineral soil. Um, at Cape Cod National Seashore, we don't have any options for mechanical treatment or harvesting. Um, we can burn and burn and burn, but unless we get the canopy of shrubs and overstory below 30%, the seedlings just don't go. And they'll, they'll be there and they're, they're gone in a year or two. So you do need to open up the overstory um, or it doesn't work. Well, I have it. I have a question for you, maybe Ken or somebody else, since we'll, we can talk to each other, I guess. Um, we've had long-term in, uh, inventories at Cape Cod, again, where there's no other disturbance unless we burn. Um, and we have a range of pure pitch pine to almost pure oak to what we call either oak pine or pine oak, somewhere in the middle. And what we see is when we get something like gypsy moss into pure oak, then you don't have much except shrubs coming up. But if you've got any pine component, that, that flourishes. At the other extreme, if something with, is pure pine or pine oak um, and something comes in, the more oak there is, the more that flourishes. So to me, I mean, it's kind of basic biology, but it seems like diversity is better than homogeneity of either one. Yeah. Uh, for years they said, well, we won't get any more gypsy moths. Uh, you know, they're done after 100 years of decimating the forest. And now we're right back. Our fire study is back to a gypsy moth and fire study, which is what it started out. Yeah. Um, but we added uh, Una Choppingham and um, Zab Aaron both did theses and published uh, the stuff. And, it, and it's clear that the most stable forest, the most long-term productive forest, is one that has a mix of, of pine and oak. It's, that's all there is. I, I think I'd agree with that. I, I think wetland, wetland forest, too, that, you know, certainly the, the lowland component of that, because certainly there's a lot of like pitch pine lowlands in, in New Jersey that are mixed in with, with other hardwoods. And so maybe that mix is more resilient. Um, to sort of take that a, a step further is, I have some colleagues that have been working on mixed forests and as a management for mixed forests. And they're thinking that they're actually going to be more um, resilient to changes in climate too. So we may actually you know, buy ourselves some, some, I don't know, greater forest resilience that we can think about. Sort of how, you know, how could you manage with these mixed type forest types? Um, I have a question regarding uh, on the metal of the model, so forgive me. Uh, how is basal area determined, and does everyone determine it the same? And also, the, the process for thinning, I mean, you're laughing already, I can tell nobody does it the same way. Um, the, uh, the thinning process, how is that approached, and is that more of a personal 
you know, Forrester, every Forrester has a way of doing it, or is it, is there an equation to it? You know, if you're going to thin a property or thin the forest, how is it done? All right, that's a really good question. So as far as basal area, I think a better way to put it would be trees per acre. Uh, basal area is really a forestry term. Essentially, it's just square foot per acre. And it's determined on size. And a uh, way we determine it most easily is a piece of glass. It's a prism. And what it does is refracts the light. And essentially, the bigger the tree is, the more it counts for, square footage-wise. Uh, it's really complicated, but I'm trying to explain it the best way. But uh, yeah, so it's determined the, the exact same. 80 basal area is the same no matter where you go. Um, and then as far as the um, marking or thinning, that's really dependent. Um, what we've done, and, and we're going to go over this in the, uh, the afternoon session, is it's called thinning from below, and we're favoring the pine because we're going into these high hazard stand areas with um, heavily pined, that we want to keep those pined, pine barrens. So we're thinning from below, meaning that we're taking out all the uh, suppressed, weaker stress trees and favoring the dominant trees, the best pine that we have. Uh, and then we're also, so once we get, remove all the poor stress trees, lower uh, suppressed, we're going out and removing the dominant, dominant trees to below that 80. Basal area, and favoring the best form and, and such, and, and you'll see that much better in the afternoon. But those are the two standard metrics: stand density, number of trees per acre or hectare, mm -hmm. and the square feet of wood that you have out per per acre. And all of us are typically managing with those two numbers in mind. We have some target that we want to get to. Sorry. It's usually like a 10, a plus or minus 10%. Right. Right. It's implemented. Basal area comes into uh, uh, <clears throat> a factor because it goes into these equations that allow us to predict whether we're, we're reducing or eliminating um, uh, can uh, the danger of canopy fires, frog fires. Um, and so the equations are just built. They were built out west, and Matt Dufanek happened to come with that talent. So realized that was something we had to solve and he figured it out for pitch pine. Um, but if you're favoring pitch pine, which we're not necessarily doing in some of our barrens, um, you can do things like selecting trees that year after year produce more cones. And those trees are out there. In our case, <coughs> we have too much pitch pine around in the heavy things. And so <coughs> excuse me, the argument was that well take out the trees that are producing all the seeds because these these were coming in like gangbusters and we were going to do just dog hair stands of pine back to where we wanted to. So it really depends on what you want um, and how much pine you really want in your pine barrens. There's different definitions of pine barrens and that pine barren category that I said went from 100 to zero in from 1940 to 1990, that has very little pitch pine in it, but it has lots of grass, lots of forbs, um, lots of irrigation shrubs. And for some insects, that's really what you want. But on the other hand, sometimes you want a lot of pitch pine. It just depends. There's, there's the technology, the, the, the knowledge out there to produce it. If you get it uh, in one place and look at this situation, this is what I want. figure out how to phrase this, but I'm curious um, for all of the panelists, if you could wave a magic wand and have one project related to restoring the pine barrens on Long Island um, happen, what would that one project be? And I know it's complex, but if you could have one project, what would that what would that be to help restore the pine and the pine barrens here? Sorry, Kathy. <laughs> Another lawsuit. You mean like a management, <laughs> a management pro project or just any project? I'll say any because yesterday, you know, last night we had a discussion about fuel reduction and you know, protecting communities and, and you know, 
screen. So there's other aspects that aren't specifically a management activity that could be somebody's first wish. My, my first wish would be to have more of the gentlemen in the back <laughs> and, these meetings and, and talk about you know the importance of the Pine Barrens and kind of have that groundswell of support for doing all these other things that we want to do because I think education is a place where some of us in forestry maybe we don't do as good of a job as, as we could and um, bringing in folks to to kind of sell our message or to talk about the good stuff that can be done is, is something I think we can do more of. I think we might get, if we pass the microphone down, which I suggest we do, eight different answers. <coughs> My wish, because I think it's really unique, <coughs> we need to focus on, I'm sorry, <coughs> the big new line for I mean, that's unique. There's some in New Jersey, there's none north of here, and there's not going to be. And that, and that I think, can probably only be accomplished with a very focused fire program. Not being from here, I would <laughs> <laughs> develop a solid um, management plan that can actually be implemented. That's comprehensive and includes all of these tools. Would be the one. Would be the one thing that I would. I would wish would happen. Not not just for any one site, but for the whole of the whole of the landscape. That can then then you have a vision for moving forward with a variety of tools and a variety of sites. This is a really hard question because it's like if we had, if I had a magic wand, like. I would have everything. Well, yeah, exactly. We wouldn't all need to be here right now. Um, I mean, I think Neil is absolutely right, and I think Bill is absolutely I think everyone's answer is going to be absolutely right, and I think it's going to be ultimately a kind of like what Neil said. We have to have a, a really good plan in place. We have to know what we want, and we have to, and it has to encompass not just from an ecological perspective or a safety perspective, but we, but it's the idea of getting education um, you know a lot of people it's they see that it's green and they think it's good and they don't understand that <laughs> no it's it's not necessarily it's not healthy and you know these are the reasons why and this is why we need management um, you know and I, and I actually like Dick's idea of you know that just the, the campaign you know um, I think that's that is really important we, we haven't had that really I think that that's been Part of what was lacking, and, and 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 you know, also what Neil was talking about earlier, just have, having a clear, concise message, um, you know, is going to be really important as we move forward. And I'm just sort of picking at all the things that I've I've <laughs> heard over the last, you know, like day. Um, yeah, I mean, I really just want to like thin and burn the crap out of everything. So it's just, <laughs> that, would, that would make me happy. You know? yeah, um, but I mean, obviously, but you know, with a not just willy nilly, you know, but with the plan in place and, and knowing what we want, knowing what we want it to look like, you know. Um, so that's my cop out answer. It's a very good answer. I I agree absolutely. Um, just. The DEC did not have a forester down here for almost seven years. Uh, so the way I look at it is pine beetles almost a silver lining in that we've taken a much more active role as we should. And uh, I'm glad you brought up about the dwarf pine because that is a globally rare ecosystem. And we are looking at this pine beetles a good way to start the conversation that we need to start looking at do we want to preserve and in fact, when we were talking about this forum, and we we're saying keeping the pine in the pine barrens, and just the title itself is that we're looking at losing in the cultural heritage of this area of the pine and keeping that in here. So I just can't say enough of having the people here again, the conversation started because we need to talk about it. We need to talk about the future of the pine barrens and what it should be. I think I'd like to see us develop a sort of across the Pine Barrens systems, if we can do it, 
um, a, a really comprehensive plan that would look at different alternatives. And at the same time, I, we, there's a stigma that we need to break here, and it's certainly with us in the, in, in, in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, is that management is bad. And, and that, that anything other than prescribed burning is a bad thing. And that's, that's really not the case. If there's, as, as John has said, there's some very, very good management that you can do. But at the same time, I think we need to be trickier and within this plan, think about how do we, how do we sell some of this? How do we sell some of these products locally? I mean, it seems silly to me that we go to Lowe's and people buy wood chips from Lowe's. Where are those chips from? In a plastic bag. Yes. I don't know. I, maybe they came from the south, but they could easily come from here. And that taps into that sort of farm to plate mentality where your products only went 100 miles or less. And so if we thought about that, I think, I think we'd have healthier stands. And that probably has to be part of a comprehensive plan, too, to kind of think about how to do this. I know we really struggle with this in New Jersey. What did we do with this wood? And we explored some sort of like almost like a boutique market where some of those chips went to went to, to, to horse people, but you you know for, for stables and things like that, but you saturate that market really fast. But there are markets there. It's just we haven't we haven't quite connected with how, how this would all work. That's my pleasure. journey. <laughs> Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to see first is a comprehensive inventory of all, at least all the publicly owned land in the Pine Barrens. Um, John Wernette and I have talked about this, you know, knowing exactly what's there, what are the, the age stands, uh, uh, what are the, the, the compositions of, uh, what are the community types that are out there. Uh, and starting with that, I certainly would like to also see a focus um, on the oldest age stands. You know, we're seeing with the Southern Pine Beetle over the last couple of years, we're seeing trees, what, up, up to 150 years old. That is one part, person pointed out, you know, we'll never see those trees again in our lifetime, you know, trees of that age. And certainly we'd like to see trees of that age for our children and our children's children. Uh, so certainly I think, you know, when we talk about old growth areas, I'm not sure that we, we have much in the way of that here uh, on Long Island or in the Pine Barrens, but certainly a focus on that, you know, that trying to protect those areas. We've we've talked about uh, management plans, comprehensive management plans in the past, and I guess going back about 10, 15 years ago, there was an attempt to try to develop a comprehensive management plan. The problem was you're talking about dozens of different agencies, organizations, stakeholders, and interested groups and trying to get all these busy people to work together and to come up you know, with an agreement on a, 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 a scheme at the 30,000 foot level, it, it was, was very, very difficult. So in my mind, what we need to do is start from the ground up with actually uh, site-specific plans and build your comprehensive plan from that end up. So with some of the plans that we've talked about today, uh, for for Sarnoff, for Rocky Point, for some of the county properties. I like to see those get done. For example, um, you know, for the last 10 years or so, the only type of uh, prescribed fire we've done here on the island is grassland burns. I, I, I had the, the opportunity, you know, I was very fortunate about 10 years ago to participate in a woodland burn, my first and only one, uh, in the Sarnoff Preserve. And uh, we haven't done anything since then. So in my mind, getting the first woodland burns done here, forest burns with woody fuel types, uh, that over the next year, that would be a tremendous milestone for me. Uh, and seeing that get accomplished because that's something we can build upon and uh, build the resources for. One of the things that has limited that is uh, the, 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 uh, the Son of Project 10 years ago uh, that was federally funded, that money ran out. So we need funding that's targeted for development of burn plans because you have to have people with certain expertise be able to pre uh, prepare those burn plans. To pre prepare those burn plans, you need to know, uh, you need to have a good inventory of the sites you're, you're, you're talking about developing the burn plans for. And then you need to have folks who are trained up uh, to do that. You need to have folks who are 
have the experience to serve as squad bosses and then as, as burn bosses to lead those, those burns. Because here on the island, we have a much narrower window in terms of when we can accomplish prescriptions. You have uh, you know, different windows for, for, for different reasons. So um, if we're able to address those things of you know, having the human resources and the fiscal resources to develop those, those burn plants and those inventories, uh, the targeted focus, and not just on state lands, but on county-owned lands and other municipal lands. I think that uh, you know we we could make it really make a big dent in terms of keeping the pines in the uh, in the pine barrens going forward. Hard to follow. Uh, guess I would argue for increments uh, and cultural consensus that. An awareness that doing nothing is not the answer. Uh, but then doing something where becomes a very complicated task. So the comprehensive management plan for the next 20 years will probably not achieve consensus. But something that take, takes increments along the way, say we can solve public health firefighter habitat issues in these sites. So therefore, they rise in priority. And then you apply the adaptive management loop that feeds back and says, are we getting what we want? Are we learning from this? And at the same time, bring along the culture that uh, they know more about marketing some of these things than uh, anybody I know, but have they been brought into the discussion? That's Can I add one thing? <laughs> I know I joke about wanting to burn everything, and yeah, I do. But I think it's really important that as we're doing all this, I mean, he was talking about adaptive management, and I just, the idea, I do a lot of monitoring. I think that we need to keep doing a lot of monitoring. We need to be collecting data. We need to be, you know, ad adapting as we go along. I mean, I listen to what, you know, they've accomplished at the Albany Pine Bush all these years, you know, and it's, it's amazing. And all that is, from, you collect a lot of data. I mean, you guys, you guys are doing research, and I think that that's a really important component of this because that's ultimately going to inform whatever work we do. And you know, knowledge is power. So you know, we need to know. We need to know what we're doing and how it's impacting, you know, everything. And and that I think just gives us more backing for you know justification for what we do. So it's important. 